Manny Pacquiao is said to be fighting Sean Porter on a pay-per-view extravaganza. Uh, like? I thought it was Thurman. Yeah, it was Thurman. Keith Thurman, sorry. And <laughs> Sean, Port- Sean Porter is going to be fighting Errol Spence. Uh, that's in the works, but we don't know if it's going to be signed yet. I bet none of those happen next. Um, Thurman's being thrown about now, right? To get... Because Thurman's a loser. Uh, Pacquiao will probably lose against Thurman. So they're using that to get Floyd out. Because they know once Pacquiao loses to Thurman, there's no money in a, in a rematch with Floyd. Thurman's being used, but... Yeah, I think you're right on that one, because that probably would be a logical. Because once Pacquiao is done, there's no mm. more Floyd talking to him. Yeah, so they're gonna but, mat, they're gonna float big names out, and then Floyd will think, "Oh, come on, in one more time before he gets too old." But this this news wasn't published as an April Fool's joke, because this is April second, and it says Pacquiao taking on Thurman on July the thirteenth on pay per view. Yeah, as as of recording. That's the only side report in it, so it could have some truth in it. The the Pacquiao April Fools joke was they announced that pa- Pacquiao and Mayweather Mayweather they're going to face off in a one on one basketball match, which um, not even a funny April Fools is pointless. But that <laughs> does, and I think Floyd's team released that. So yeah, no doubt. I'm wondering, is that Floyd thinking about Pacquiao? You know, I know he. Obviously not going to be basketball, but is that Floyd checking, you know, testing the waters? But, yeah. Uh, the Spence, uh, the Spence fight won't happen next either. The, um, the Spence and Porter, that won't be the next fight. You, you know what's going to happen. They will fight on the same card next time out, but it won't be against each other. Yeah. We, we don't get fights, you know, we don't get fights thrown. Oh, if you can hear my background, that we got hailstones up here, so I want to apologise for that. No, we can't hear it. Ah, cool. It's just driving me nuts, so. The, yeah, the Spence and Sh- uh, the that one happened next. The thing is, they got Terence Crawford uh, saying he'll fight Spence after he fights Amir Khan. Hmm. So, so there's not going to be any decisions for two weeks? No. You know, because if if Crawford, I mean, now if Khan beats Crawford, you'll see you will see a unification fight next because they'll throw him in against Spence. They, that won't require any you know building. They'll just chuck him straight in. So they're gonna wait for two weeks to see how the Crawford Crawford situation plays out first before we get any official announce, announcements. I think. Yeah, because Khan looks like the underdog there, but obviously you can't count him out totally, can you? Yeah, you can never count anybody out, but. Pretty confident in counting Khan out in this one. So, in other news, David Price's opponent, Cash Ali, is obviously going to get fined for, for his um, disqualification loss. Been suspended as well, isn't he? Spe- yeah, they haven't said much how long as he been suspended for. But, no. um, or with all in his purse as well. Yeah. It's, um, it'll, it'll take a couple of weeks to play out that well. Would you like to think he was? Because they've got to do due process and all that, so it's only a couple of days removed from the event, and there. Um, yeah. Four, four um, times I, I read four times because David Price is not on my to watch list anymore. So I had no, you know, it was an ugly build up to that fight as well, and there they were getting quite, quite some ugly talk. Yeah, I was a character for Price, and yeah. I watched the fight. Yeah, I didn't. I wasn't for a bet, and I didn't bother. <laughs> what would your bet be that Price gets knocked out? I would have put. Cash Ali for a late round stoppage. Yeah. Uh, he started to come on and look like that, but uh, obviously when he went to the ground, he decided to bite him, didn't he? Yeah. You know, David Price lives to fight another day. So. So there's talk now. He either wants Vladimir Kl- Klitschko if he comes back, uh, or he wants the winner of Dave Allen versus Lucas Brown. Oh, uh, that seems a bit more in his, you know. But I mean, by all accounts, he was fed in in that fight against Cash Ali and Cash Ali seems to be like a club level fighter but he so, was undefeated prospect at the time so <laughs> yeah but he, he looked like a club fighter is he trying to say that? yeah no he, you know before the fight they said you know he had no momentum it was like the upside was you know a good show in here he's probably going to be one of those litmus tests for British heavyweights going forward there was never any sort of championship hype behind him yeah you know so I never, I never heard of him before. And, uh, no, it, 
he was not a guy that had backing, you know. So this is his level, and mm. you know, by all accounts, he, he was losing. Uh, but we all know how Price fades. You, you don't have to bite him. You don't bite Price till the tenth round. Everyone knows that, because you can knock him out before then. Yeah. Uh, um, one one other bit of news: um, the Lunga Mock is planning a farewell fight. Um, he's six, 46 years of age, and he's uh, known for going in with all the best fighters like David Hay mm. many years ago, and uh, recently he went in with and lost to uh, Avon Yildrim, who just lost his fight with uh, uh, Anthony Durrell for the WBC Super Middleweight title. So this guy's been knocking around the world scene for. Something, something like 26 years or 28 years yeah 28 years but looks like it's a long career talk? and uh, any finally, potential opponents I think he'd be looking to get, go up with a win so it's not not going to be a, a big opponent I would have thought but they are yeah. talking about a minor belt like the IBA Intercontinental Super Midweight Crown so mm. it's just a, a bit of news because the guys served his uh, time against all the best in his weight uh, categories and above, so good luck to him. Hmm. Yeah, I've never heard of him. Um, I think he dropped. He actually dropped today on his uh, backside in one of his fights, early fights. Oh. Fought, I think he. Um, but uh, obviously he's outweighed by a considerable amount of weight. This. But I think only in the last few years he's he's been fighting the same weight all the time. So he's going to bow, bow up with his uh, 60th professional fight. Hmm. Hmm. I have to uh, research him to get some images and some footage of him up on the... Yeah, what was the name again? The Linda Mock. The Linda Mock. So, so he's not uh, quite... He's, he's a higher level than the Buckleys, the Peter Buckleys of the world, is he? Oh, he's definitely world class. But like right. uh, you say, about a fringe safe top 15... He was always like knocking on the door for like um, oh, eliminators and all that sort of stuff, but never good enough to win them. Oh. You know, uh, could you, you could probably say just below like a Martin Murray level. Oh, I, I get the idea. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. So the guy who, who Martin Murray was, people we we used beat in that sort of level, like you know, just on the cusp. Comeback fight by Jason Maloney. He was a fight the year candidate last time out against Emmanuel Rodriguez right. in the World Boxing Super Series. And he had a comeback fight in the weekend against Chris Paulino, 19 and 3, and he stopped him in five rounds. It looks like he was no um, adverse effects to, to his last fight, you know, being at war. So he looks like he's back on the uh, on the title run. So when you say come comeback, did he lose his last fight? Uh, he lost to Emmanuel Rodriguez at, uh, for, in the WBSS for the right. IBF bantamweight title. Right. But he was like a fight the year candidate. He was a split loss. And uh, it was one of those fights where he should have done more in, in the early goings and the last four were complete war. Mm. And he was he seemed to be pushing himself forward at every opportunity and throwing every shot in the book, but couldn't get the guy out of there. So. He took a narrow loss by there, but it was good to see him come back and uh, look quite fresh. Um, are you, is his um, brother won last week? I don't know if you remember. Are you, I didn't speak to you last week, but his brother won last week. Right. I think we covered the, the fight in a previous podcast. Um, he was in Chile as well, so I think that's why he caught my attention, because he was in an obscure sort of place for an Australian box to be fighting. Hmm. But, um, so this weekend on the um, Eddie Hearn bill, did you uh, watch much of that? No, I didn't watch. I didn't catch any of it this weekend. It was nothing that really stood out for me to, to get me interested. I know Liam Smith was the headliner. 
Yeah, we'll, we'll start with him. In, uh, Liam Smith, mm. Sam Egerton. He's a headliner, but he was. you kind of knew that Smith was going to win anyway. And, yeah. Uh, and that's what he was. He just beat Egerton up until the referee stopped the fight, basically. Yeah, it is. Uh, it, it was. A, a, was it a, like a domestic rivalry, um, or was it a tune-up fight? No, it was more a tune-up fight for Smith. I know. I know. Um, Egerton was like going forward his career a couple of years back, but recently I think um, he's starting to show effects of the wars he's been having. Mm. So obviously Smith won TKO five in that fight. The vegan World Boxing Council Super Silver Super Welterweight title. Right. <laughs> now that title, I was supposed to give him sort of a, not a mandatory shot at the WBC belt, but it's going to put him in, you know, the contention. Yeah, I suppose as long as he keeps winning and he's with her, and he's always going to be in contention anyway, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, on the undercard, we saw Robbie Davis Jr. take a take a unanimous decision over in 12 rounds over Joe Hughes for the uh, British Super Lightweight title and the mm. EBU European Super Lightweight title so that's two good titles to, in one fight there and the EBU title should guarantee you a top 15 ranking anyway yeah, yeah so, that, that was always the case in the past wasn't it yeah so, but it was a close contested fight some people have said preferred Hughes' his work, but uh, myself, I preferred uh, Robbie Davis Jr.'s work. A bit more, a bit more uh, concise. Mm. Uh, the other results was um, Tom Farrell uh, lost uh, lost his um, Commonwealth title shot against Phil Bowes. Um, I didn't see the fight, but from all accounts, uh, Bowes dominated and uh, he's another contender at super lightweight so I'd think it'd be a good, good idea to put Bowes in with Robbie Davis Jr. as a um, for all the belts you know you love mm. British Commonwealth and European then. by the placement of the card you might think that Hearn's already thinking of that I'd imagine wouldn't he yeah I don't know if he does think of that because he tends to want his sort of guys go separate directions a lot of the time but hopefully he'll see sense with this hmm um, probably the best fight on the card was uh, Anthony Fowler lost some points to Scott, uh, Scott Fritz- Fitzgerald both undefeated going in uh, Fitzgerald was 11-0 and Anthony Fowler was uh, 9-0 Fowler was a former Olympian and he was a slight favourite going in uh, Fitzgerald uh, secured the fight with a knockdown in the last round and uh, captured the World Boxing Association International Super Worldweight title. Oh, right, there was a title there then. Mm. Um, yeah, you seen by uh, Fitzgerald uh, weighed six ounces over the championship limit, but it took three times to get uh, to the weight. So, mm. so that was uh, well. probably, this, for me, the second best fight I've seen on the weekend. Um. M- and he wasn't David Price versus Cash Alley. <laughs> <laughs> Fair play to David Price. He's always, he's always in entertaining scraps, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> um, there were a couple of upsets on the end of the card as well. Um, Craig Glover was undefeated going in 9 and 0. He was a cruiserweight. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's fighting a guy who's uh, 13 wins and 7 losses. Vakla Pesha. I think it's Pesha. Um, on, on paper, you think this, this fight guy he should be winning this fight, but then he gets promptly stopped in two rounds. So it's hard to, it's hard to say what sort of opposition Craig Lever was fighting beforehand. But you'd, you'd expect an unbeaten prospect though to, to to win against the thirteen and seven sort of journeyman type, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, that's always a bad sign. <laughs> yeah, so it was. Quite, I was trying to think there's a, there's a few other ones on the, on the card as well which had uh, upsets but um, I can't put my finger on it at the moment anyway that's that for that card did you see um, there's another fight that I, I took notice of I didn't see the fight because it wasn't televised Joe Pigford 14-0 TKO3 over Adam Krablek 
the reason why I'm picking this guy out is because he used to fight under the Frank Warren banner on BT Sports. Yeah. He's like, he's had a year out. He's a really exciting fighter. Really leaky defense. So I don't know if he's had a year off to, you know, uh, own his skills, get his defense in order, or whether it was some sort of contractual sort of dispute. What's his record? Um, 15 and 0 now. Joe, Joe Pigford. Yeah, that kind he's of got 14. You should never have time off. KOs, yeah, yeah, mm. 14 KOs. He's beaten some good guys, but when you see him fight, you sort, you sort of think, well, he's a bit like Brandon Rios and taking too many shots. Mm. But this time off, I'm I'm hoping he's gonna look a bit better in, in the uh, defense department. So it is what it is. There. If he's uh, gonna continue, he's gonna have to get his defense sorted out. I don't like it when these like uh, up and comers are fighting with the same regularity as champions. You know, it's not even like champions doing that. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna nip over to another bill from um, from Spain. Kermin Liraga he was the European welterweight title. This guy going in was 27 wins undefeated, mm. with 22 KOs, up against um, David Avanesian, who was 22 win, uh, 23 wins, three losses, and one draw. Um, what, was, what was interesting about um, Liraga, he's the big puncher, sort of like a Nigel Ben sort of power level, I think. And he sort of rolled over the uh, the British um, scene with over beating Frankie Gavin in four four rounds and Bradley Skeet in two. Um, this Avanesian, he's a former WBA regular world champion, beating the likes of Shane Mosley. Oh, right, I thought I recognised it right, yeah. Yeah, but he's, he's also lost uh, to Lamont Peterson on on, um, on points for that title. And also the up and coming uh, prospect. Um, I can't even pronounce his name. Egidius Cavaliascas. If you can do a better pronunciation of that, you may guess. No. But he's, no. he's from Lithuania, he's promoted by top rank. He also fought in the weekend. Um, so this this L- Liraga fight against Avanesian, he's sort of the like the Ben Watson sort of fight going back in the day. And uh, basically, the first three rounds was uh, to the champion. Then Avanesian came back in the fourth, dropped his man, and he went back and forth a bit. And then eight and uh, seven and eight. Liraga sort of got his act together, put put the heat on sort of Avanesian, but then Avanesian came back in round nine and stopped him on his feet and uh, with a barrage of punches. Punch so he was quite exciting, probably the, that's the best fight of the weekend for me. Hmm. So and the one last bill we need to cover now is the uh, the top rank card with Alexander Gavoznik. Right. He defended his World Boxing Council light heavyweight title against Dudu Nagambu. Nagambu was unable to continue due to a calf injury. Well, it looked like he put four rounds of action, sorry, sorry, 12 rounds of action into four rounds to survive Gervodzik, um his power. And it looked like he should have just pulled out with a calf injury because that's what he had to do. I'm not questioning his injury, but it did look a bit suspicious. Sounds like you're calling him a coward. <laughs> Sorry. Well, you say before, and he, he had li- he had life changing money, so no I way. Don't know if he, yeah. So obviously, oh, okay. If that's the case, well, the way you say that at the beginning, but he's mm. been around a long time, so maybe he thought, well, I'll take this and go now. Oh, right. Yeah, but probably. the thing is, he's from France, so France to have life changing money out there. He must have been a good payday. Yeah. Because France is not, not cheap, like. I mean, technically, five thousand pounds is life-changing money. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if he's just like really short-term thinking there. You know, Perhaps you want to pay his council tax and that's it. <laughs> yeah, I can buy an Xbox. And it's going to change my life. And the guy so, I just mentioned as well, uh, Egg Egg Cavaliascas. Cavaliascas, sorry, yeah, Cavaliascas. He had a draw with Ray Robinson, um, majority draw over 10 rounds. 
Uh, some people are saying Robson should have won. But he's one of those fights where one guy sort of stays on the outside counters and the other guy's been the aggressive fighter. So I, don't, I think it was a fair result. That was for the NABF welterweight title. NABF. So still vacant. Mm. Okay, does that wrap up the news? Yeah, that, that wraps up the uh, the weekend uh, action. Okay. So next, now we're going to be... Let me just write that down. Hang on. We are on 21. I do like pronounce that guy's name. Doesn't matter. Why top 21. rank? Why don't you just... News. Finish it. Yeah, finish it. That's the results, sorry, isn't it? Yeah. But that guy... Bloody, I still have an awkward name like that, like. Mm. Right, we're going to go into the prospects zone now, right? I know. Yeah, I'm going to post that to you now, so you can look at his name. It's pissing me off. <laughs> I guarantee it won't piss me off, because I won't spend any time on it. <laughs> he could be the next world champion, if he's promoted by top rank. Yeah, and then we'll <laughs> when, when when the whole world couldn't quite work out what pa- how to spell or pronounce Pacquiao, we just called him Pac-Man. <laughs> So we come up with a nickname. Eggman says... Golovkin was a bit too hard for people, so they just called him Triple G. We'll Englishize yeah. it. So... Right. Every week, Aiden is tasked with finding a prospect that we should all be watching. Who is this week's prospect, Aiden? Esquiva Falcao. 22-0. 15 KOs. Boxer at middleweight. Middleweight. Okay, why are we watching this guy for? Uh, first of all, he's a bit of a household name in uh, Brazil. Mm. Him and his brother did well in the Olympic Games and uh, in the Amateur Code. And obviously, big fallen fallen up there. And we've seen Esquiva Falcao on the uh, top rank circuit. Yeah, he's a top rank fighter. Yeah. So he's, he's obviously going to get some uh, exposure there in the US. I, I have a couple of issues. I mean. Um... Our listeners will soon find out that I'm t- Aiden identifies them then I gotta spend the whole week watching videos because I'm always behind him um, and I looked at Falcao and I, I liked what I read you know he's an Olympic silver medalist uh, for UK people he beat in the amateur circuits and near go go twice at least twice that's all I can find you know but then I started to watch a couple of his fights and he's a left-handed, he's a right-handed southpaw. So like a Michael Mora, his dad trained him to fight southpaw, even though he's naturally orthodox. And he's averaged three to four fights over the last four years. Three to four yeah. fights per year over the last four years. And um, I don't see it. I don't see this guy, you know, with the middleweight division being what it is. I don't see this guy making a dent. I really don't. I mean, he's been fluctuating with his weight. He's, you know, some some fights he's coming over the 160 limit. He's he's big at the weight. I'll give him that. But the fights that I watched, you know, considering this guy's fighting three times a year, then you know, three times a year for the last two years, then no urgency, no dynamic sort of. I think you've picked a dud, is what I'm saying. I, 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 yeah, wouldn't say, I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that to his face. He's supposed to argue your point with me. I, I was, I was, <laughs> I was, I was you made me that silence made me look even more of a dick. No, it's, uh, I don't. I don't think he's a dick. I think top rank invested in him. I think he's got. He's got this has got to be his year, obviously, on and next year because he's 29 years, years of age. But I think what's holding him up now is is all this um, sort of shenanigans between Charlo. Golovkin, um, Jacobs, and Canelo. There's no but once all last done with, yeah. But once once all last done, once the smoke has been cleared, I think next year he could be looking at a title shot. But what I found interesting, his last fight was the first because because his family is uh, a famous martial arts family. His dad went. Um, his dad is a martial artist, and he had eleven kids. Yeah. But they're big names in you know in Brazil and it was his first fight against Miranda that was his first fight, professional fight in Brazil and all those wins in 23 fights he's only fought once in Brazil so I wonder if Top Rank are now concentrating on 
putting him over Brazil to you know increase his brand a bit more to give him a bit more bargaining power because the, the big names at the top of the middleweight division are not going to look at him are they he's not an easy tune up he's not an easy he's not an easy defence he's not going to force his way in for at least 18 months so I wonder if they're going to try mm. and get a whole nation behind him I just thought it was interesting that the, out of all the fights what, only fight, one what fight, fight do you mention him? the Jorge Daniel Miranda fight he fought um Oh, sorry. Yeah, hang on. Um. Wow. That, now that's interesting. I've got a fight here. No, it hasn't happened yet, does it? I can't find that on Patrick. <laughs> sorry. It, it 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 happened according to his website. It happened, and that's interesting. It's the first time I I've seen a fight on that's not on box records and yet it's, it's recorded that he won a unanimous decision over a Jorge Daniel Miranda on the Portobello Resort and Safari in Man- in Rio de, Rio de Janeiro five, three days ago oh. um. hmm. and yet box records are showing as Pito as his last fight So I wonder. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's right. Unless you, unless he's done like a white collar thing, mm, it should something. be a bit unusual, wouldn't it? Yeah, uh, um, yeah, because box records is showing twenty two and oh. Top ranks page is showing twenty three and oh. Uh. So there, so there's a fight there that's happened that. Um, it's and, gone on the radar. Yeah. So. I don't know what that's about, but it was in Brazil, so it might have been a show. Yeah, I mean, Top Rank have registered it. They've registered the record update. They haven't registered the fight on the fight history. We got a very interesting background. But I was watching him, and he just looked a bit. I don't know if he was drained at the weight because he he seems to struggle to hit 160. I mean, you got a Wikipedia page just telling everybody that he's a super middleweight and then you've got a box records page saying he's a middleweight well top yeah. rank that's the problem with uh, these days top. everybody seems to be fighting outside the weight category until there's a title fight so you well, get a middleweight coming in at 162 regardless like, you know. well top on the top top rank website they got him as a super middleweight so is yeah. and yet his last fight on box record was middleweight yeah 159 Mm, Which is so quite good it, discipline because he's, he's, he's no title on the line, but after that last fight. So that's interesting then. If the if top rank has seen him as a super middleweight, they obviously see the congestion at middleweight, so they might be steering him in that direction. But I want to know why yeah. we got we we got a fight that happened. The box records are not accepting it. But because normally it, you'd you'd have a, a, a note in it saying it's um, unsanctioned or something, wouldn't you? Hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting. Like the Danny Williams sort of fight, wasn't it? Before Danny Williams fought that junior middleweight in it under different rules. And he wasn't sort of uh, on, on the record, like. Hmm. Still, for a top prospect, be doing, doing that, it's silly. The lost fight of La P- Pantera, that's his nickname, La, La Pantera, isn't it? He's, um... So, yeah, I... So there, it's Miranda, is he? No. Right. I'm on the I'm on the top rank website. 29, all the other stats are right, and I was on his YouTube, he got his own YouTube channel as well. It was all in, yeah, all, Portu- all Portuguese interviews. But he, you know, he, he, yeah, done, they... he had a good amateur career. I mean, he's got good fundamentalists, uh, fun- fundamentals, he world championship bronze medal, Olympic silver medal. I don't know what um, the Brazilian national championships are worth, but he had a Go medalist, go medal of that. He's uh, you got a obviously you know we got a brother. You got you know, you got ten brothers. Uh, what I find interesting is that they interviewed his dad uh, after after they both won at the Olympics. All right. And, uh, and his dad said, you know, I met my wife when she was fifteen. She was a small blesser, but I said, <laughs> just give me ten kids, and she gave me eleven. And <laughs> these two boys are. Uh, uh, my life's worth, you know, my life's work. <laughs> it's like you, you, you just like, hmm. There's a lot to unpack there. One, your, your wife is 15, 
Two, yeah. you child you grooming. Instantly, yeah, and secondly, you instantly look past it as a person. You just saw it as a breeder. So, <laughs> <laughs> and then, right? Not only that, you then disparaged your nine other sons by saying these two are the only worthwhile ones I had. God. Yeah. Yeah, shocking. Eh? And he said he taught it out a punch by shadow boxing with the boys when they were in the womb. <laughs> so he even encourages his sons to batter the mother from the inside. <laughs> he seems but, like a crazy guy. So we look at if you look at the top middleweights now, I think once like I said like I said next year once all the smoke is cleared. I don't think he's gonna be a middleweight. I think top ranks him as a super middleweight. But hundred and sixty and a half. I thought he's weight drained and he's but then why would you come in at 160 and a half pounds for like a non-title fight? Yeah, but you'd think you'd think though he he's obviously been positioned as a super middleweight because top you know Box Rex can make a mistake, Wikipedia can make a mis- mistake, but top rank are the ones assigned him, promoting him, and they got him in the weight class of super middleweight. But then again, wouldn't it be more beneficial if he know he can make middleweight to go for middleweights? Because nothing the... there though. There's nothing happening in the middleweight. You know, in super middleweight, he got options. He got fringe. He, he he got four titles and no massive, massive name. Yeah. You know, so he could lure one of them back to Brazil, or you know, he could get one of them as a. On the other hand, he's got Rob Brandt uh, in, on top rank as well, only the WBA mm. champion. So that could be a fight for the future as well. I don't see. From what I've seen of this guy, you know, right-handed southpaws always always weird to me. That is why why you would. You know, back convention and yeah. lead with your stronger hand. You know, you take away, you lead him with your power punch. I don't, um, I just don't see this guy. I think he's a really good find, really good someone to watch, but I think he might get a title as super middleweight, but I don't think he got a chance at middleweight. I mean, right, you, you, right. look, you look at his box records, he's never on weight. He's always a pound or half a pound over or two pounds over. He got no good days in middleweight ahead of him. Right. So I, I'm gonna take a pick. Uh, I'll say he'll be fighting Rob Brandt this time before this time next year, and if not, he's he gonna have to fight the super middleweight. Yeah, I I think he's gonna go for one of the middleweight uh, super middleweight titles. He won't even entertain. I my prediction is we don't see him in a high profile middleweight fight. The Super Fight Fight. Monday night, April 6th, the two greatest fighters in the world. The live closed circuit color telecast. Marvelous Marvin Hagler and Sugar Ray Leonard. Hagler, unbeaten in 11 years. Leonard, younger, faster, and more determined than ever. See it only on giant closed circuit TVs. Tickets in all box offices, Hudson's, and Ticketmaster outlets. The Super Fight Fight. Hagler versus Leonard, April 6th. I want to start off with an interesting fact that I found out in my research for this fight. Um, Hagler and Leonard b- both challenged for their first world title on the same card. Yeah. I didn't know that. I didn't know they were both in championship. They started their championship careers at the same time. I just assumed Hagler had been around longer, you know. So Hagler was fighting in feet you want the firm or... Yeah. Um, and a draw. So I think the rivalry started there because, for all accounts, Hagler got forty thousand dollars. You know, this is a guy with forty odd fights, finally challenges for a world Thank title, you. and he's not even the main event, and he's mm. only getting forty, fifty thousand dollars, and then he sees this guy, you know, Sugar Ray Leonard, the opposite of everything he stands for, getting a couple of hundred thousand in the main event as a challenger. So mm-hmm. I think the seeds in Hagler started on that day, you know. So the thing is with that, uh, yeah, yeah, you, you the go. With, yeah, the thing with that is the amateur uh, system. You're actually getting paid, not getting paid for getting beaten up. So when you get a pro like Hagler, sort of, you know, bitching about, oh, I've come up the hard way. Well, have you really come up the hard way in that, in that respect? Because 
you're fighting for money, and the other guy is getting punched in the face for free. That's a really good way of looking at it. Yeah, you know, because yeah. well, then then you got Hagler's story where he said his first fight was forty bucks. Yeah. You know, so but how many how many amateurs go to the top and never become nothing? Like like if you think some people could spend like two hundred fights in, in the amateur code. And then turn pro and then lose a couple of pro fights and never be seen again. And they've got basically got nothing out of the sport. I think we'll find it. If you turn, yeah. yeah. We, we'll find at the, we, we, we will find out at the end of this episode that Hagler just likes complaining about anything. You know? <laughs> so you you just killed one of his arguments it, 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 with, with, with barely any thought. You, you're right. You know, he, he didn't have much of an extensive, uh, you know, amateur career as. as as Leonard, but he was getting paid. Leonard wasn't. I know yeah. people like Leonard had endorsements and stuff. So yeah, they've just taken one argument like, away from Agler. Yeah, and Agler, and it does work because obviously Mike Tyson didn't have you know the, the Olympic gold medal, and he did extrem- exceptionally well with the money, didn't he? So it, it blows the argument about the water about the amateur getting more than a pro, because mm. obviously Tyson was a pro and he turned pro early. But I think it's it's about the market as well, and if you're exciting or not exciting and stuff. So we're gonna yeah. jump a ca- we're gonna jump ahead a couple of years, and we're gonna see Sugar Ray, Le- Ray Leonard retire twice, and then we're gonna see Hagler in during Ray Leonard's retire retirement finally come to the mainstream with the Caesar wins over Roberto Duran, and more notably Thomas Hearns. So. He beats Thomas Hearns, and suddenly Hagler, you know, up until he, he beat Thomas Hearns, Hagler was craving a Leonard fight because he thought that was the fight that would give him exposure. Thomas Hearns would end yeah. up being the one to give him the exposure he needed. And then suddenly, suddenly Hagler, he lives in a world where he doesn't need a Leonard fight. But Leonard calls him out. So the fight is on. You know, we've got this super fight. Leonard has been out of the ring, been out of the ring for four or five years. He had that one bad, you know, yeah, that one bad fight. So yeah, yeah that's a horrible fight, didn't he? With Kevin Howard, he got dropped in the, in the fourth round, got up and mm. rallied to stop him in the round nine. But to be fair, Howard is a good fighter, and uh, but Leonard did did look low par. Yeah, and I mean, you gotta wonder why why was him uh, motivation he was below below par or or was it something else? Yeah, it's it could be a multitude of things, you know, just bad stylistic matchup. He under it underestimated the opponent, just thought he's going to roll him over. Regardless, Leonard scurries away, disappears. Hagler makes a name for himself. Now, in my opinion, three months or four months before the fight is made, the fight takes place is where the fight was won at the negotiation table. That was where this fight, the fight that would happen, that was where it was won. And Leonard won the negotiations because is that because he he chose the twelve round distance and not only did he ring yeah not only did he choose the twelve round distance he paid for it he paid a million dollars to Marvin Hagler to for Hagler to ignore the last three rounds and just settle on and, and sanction the fight for twelve rounds that decision yeah proved That's so costly. costly. Yeah, one million dollars for your legacy. That's what that was cost, you know. Because you can say what you want about the fight, right? You can say about you, you, you know, every whoever, who, whoever your guy was going into that fight, you, you could make a reason for him to win, right? But coming out of that fight, the people who want who saw Hagler win say that you know Leonard was in, Leonard was unfair, unfair in the negotiations. You know, Leonard got the bigger ring, he got the lower, the, the shorter fight distance, but. What they don't remember is Hagler agreed to all this. And Hagler, at that point in time, wasn't really interested in a Leonard fight. He had nothing to gain. He was two fights away from equal in the middleweight defense record. He didn't want to fight Leonard. Right? Yeah. So Leonard comes in and he comes in with all his money. Hagler's already made his money. But he still accepts all these stipulations as Leonard's put in place. And why? Because he underestimated Leonard. And champions don't underestimate, not supposed to underestimate anybody. So that fight was won. No, but Hagler's mentality as well is I don't watch no other boxer box. They watch me. So this is sort of um, a bit of arrogance there. Isn't it? And it mm. did show in the fight as well. It definitely did, the first four rounds especially. But um, 
Because he yeah. was boxing uh, orthodox in the first few rounds, and he a haggler. Well, we get to that. It. It, it was watching the build up to this. It was in Caesar Caesar's pal the car park in Caesar's Palace. It was, wasn't it? Yeah. What what happened to fights being staged there? Remember in the nineties and eighties and nineties, us they were always in the car park. I think Caesar's Palace was overtaken by other venues like uh, the MGM Grand. I think I don't think there's anything. Uh, because yeah, there's other fights after that one in in the same venue. Yeah, because um, there was a lot of Don King cards were in there, weren't they? Yeah, and, right. I, and I think it's, yeah, it's down to the venues really because obviously MGM Grand pays the big bucks now. I think there was another one um, where Holyfield Douglas fought. That was another big hotel complex, wasn't it? Who was there? Well, uh, Steve Wynn owned it, so I don't know what uh, what, what that was. I was watching them construct the ring. They got like a, a slow, a fast motion of them building the ring, and then they start cutting to all these like big out of town high road. It was a true mega fight, wasn't it? You know, you had all these celebrities, but it was really very much a time of the eighties. You know, everybody had obviously just watched an episode of Miami Vice, so they turned up in the Lamborghinis with their shades on, <laughs> the white suits, and you know, all, all of them are, are just starting to pack in, and then you see. There's it was yeah it was women sort of ring side women all this glittery sort of yeah. proper 80s sort of style I got caught up yeah. in it every time I watched that this week I got so excited you know it was like someone made a movie of the 80s because it was so cliche you know <laughs> it, it, it was a really mad time and then you see then the music starts and then Leonard comes out and you got this weird sort of like horrible it's not a dressing gown it's, a, it's one of those 80s Michael Jackson jacket, jackets yeah. Which are like high waist, <laughs> shoulder pads. <laughs> he looks awful. <laughs> yeah, it was nothing wrong, I, with shoulder, nothing wrong with shoulder pads. Ugly <laughs> that. I I just loved. Mm. I loved all the build up. I I, I loved Hagler's walk in, and then what I didn't realize, but my memory has had it in, was it wasn't no Buffer or Jimmy Leonard Jr. doing the the intros. It was just some boring. No really boring bland the ladies and gentlemen the super middleweight and the middleweight champion of the world and it was like oh you, you've just taken me out a bit yeah you know I remember the guy I think he'd, he'd done a lot of fights back in those days yeah, um, I think he did did he do the Tyson Burbick and Chavez fights oh you must I know have. the guy you're on about but I just remembered the iconic ones, you know, because Richard Steele, you know, the picture was perfect. Richard Steele was waiting to get officiated, you know, you know, the celebrities in the background, the, the cameras, the lighting was perfect. And then this boring announcer comes in and says, ladies and the band. And I was like, <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. And then. <laughs> I like him, though. I think he's correct. No. Rubbish. We will have just played him in our intro now, and it's it doesn't feel big, you know, anymore. There's no. <laughs> And then the fight happens. So okay, let me ask you a question: Was it a big get announcer before Buffer? They can't have been. You know, they can't have been. But it shows how much Buffer and Lennon changed the game. That all my boxing memories, I've got them announcing the fights, yeah. even if they did or not. <laughs> even if they did or not, and. Uh, it's better than the UK one at the time. You had my lords, ladies and gentlemen. Oh my god, I'm so glad they stopped that. <laughs> How many lords attending these fights? Enough oh, for them no. to be called out in every fight. <laughs> it was like yeah. I never saw one monocle in the entire time we but went watching boxing. Probably comes from the time when Jimmy Wild used to fight with the Prince of Wales in, in the audience, wasn't he? Probably. Uh, a hundred years lord, ago. Ladies, gentlemen and wenches. Oh, <laughs> it's uh and then, and then the fight starts, Ed. So we're gonna go, we're gonna go straight to the arguing part. Who won uh, that okay. fight? Who won that fight? Uh, I, I would like to say it was Hagler, but You're wrong. I begrudgingly <laughs> say it might have been a narrow victory for Leonard because Hagler gave some rounds away. But the argument for me, back in the day, there was a British uh, scoring system of half points, and if you <laughs> scored during a half point system where the person who steals around gets the half point victory and the person who wins around gets a point victory I give it a haggler by a narrow margin mm. yeah I'm um, not going to attack that as much as I thought I was going to um, well, if, you, if you score the other fights like say Tyson Fury Deontay Wilde and you score the that you get a lot more better sort of feel for the fight you know and you, more accuracy I think 
oh, then again, you're from a judging. Yeah, people don't have trouble counting anyway. I um I think I think it's one of these fights that is impossible it's impossible to fairly judge it because you, you unless you were there that no there is no way of in my eyes Leonard I watched it three times this week Leonard won twice and then he drew somehow in one of them right and I think I was just trying to be a, look at it from an Agler point of view but the fact remains that you listen to the commentary right. They weren't commentating Biased. on the fight. Yeah, they were not commentating <laughs> on any fight that was happening that I was watching. They were just amazed that Leonard was alive after every round. And that yeah, was almost winning him. Oh, that, you know, so anyone who watched it live would have been influenced no matter what broadcast feed you watched it on. You know, it's, it's such a strange way. I tried watching it without the, the sound. And then I, then I realized when I put the sound back on how loud... Leonard's punches were he was slapping you know a lot of it was not like the Joe Calzaghe slapping but that man knew what he was doing you know he, yeah he, he, was, studying, he had a game plan mm, they had to call you can hear Dundee shouting 30 seconds left and he would do his, his smacking him about and and he, he just he exposed Mar- Marvin Hagler for the age of Marvin Hagler you know not the, you know, 32 is a young age isn't it but the fighting it's age wars, yeah, yeah. You know, and it was a. I loved, you know, I loved everything about Leonard's performance. The way he would, he, he was almost trying to employ a no mass strategy where he was going to try and get Hagler to quit through rage of some kind. You know, because I, I go back to shit. I go back to another story you interest you know, it's a uh, Red and Ring magazine, or it might be in KO magazine back in the day, and Leonard apparently wanted to go toe to toe with Hagler like Hearns did in the beginning. But then he got dropped by his sparring partner, Quincy Taylor, who went on to win the WBC middleweight title. Oh, I wonder if there's any truth to that then. Oh, Leonard's a mad bastard. So, and of course, if you get dropped by uh, a normal middleweight like that, a normal powered middleweight, you're going to think, oh, I better change my tactics. And that's where the tactics come from, apparently. Hmm. Yes, uh, I just... Oh, I loved it. I, I, I hadn't watched it in its entirety till the night it was... Because remember when we were in our country, we'd have it the night after, wouldn't we? Yeah. You know, it be, Yeah, so I watched it that night. Another, I watched it. Another small story about Leonard. Apparently, him and Hagner became sort of... Leonard purposely struck up a friendship a couple of years before. And they're sort of opening up these, like, supermarkets or whatever they're doing, you know, and... Uh, and... It, Bit of a friendship going, and of course, when he turned and challenged Hagler, then Hagler got really bitter and nasty, but because he never liked to have a, a friend as a as a mm. as a foe, like you know. It seems like Leonard trolled him for about eleven years, from the day they both fought for world titles on the same card. Leonard must have known they passed were going to collide, and he'd need he need he'd need every advantage he could, you know. So he Possibly, just but then. When Hagler had his draw with a veto on the firm, maybe he might have thought, well, he's off the radar for the time being. Yeah, you know, Leonard did other things, to, you know, but they were talking about a Leonard fight after the Hearns fight, weren't they? Uh, they are talking about a Hagler fight. The talk had started really early. Yeah. You know, so whereas Hagler went Hearns. on and... Yeah. Hagler went on got a book, and... got a book here somewhere which says, which obviously was dated in around 1984, saying, oh, the fight of the century would have been Hagler versus Leonard if Leonard hadn't retired. And that was mm. in the book. So they believed at the time he was never going to happen. And uh, But after the Duran fought Hagler, apparently Duran leaned over to the ropes and said to Leonard, you can win this. <laughs> and then probably so might give him an idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and I, I, when I go back, it's 32 years ago this week, but when I remember back, Hagler in my mind was was the older man you know and yet they were only two years apart he was well he's rumored to be around about 35 though i think was he so i don't know if that's he said 32 but it's like a lot of guys of that that sort of era they used to say i'd take a few years off like you know mm. i mean the mileage on him was it was ridiculous you know and and you know you had the it was uh, i well, lost my beast train of fight John Mugabe fight was a tough one. That was after Hearns fight. Yeah. 
to me. I mean, um, again, Leonard saw in that fight. He saw. He said that Mugabe made him miss, but he didn't make him pay. So, yeah. You know. You see a cut to the shot as the as the fight ends with Mugabe. <laughs> they they pan the camera and and Leonard's looking at Hagler like a hungry kid would be looking at a KFC. Yeah. <laughs> like, like oh my god. And uh, Leonard knew well, then. The other, the other advantage, well, I don't know if, if Hagler would have made a difference. But on the day um, on the day, Wayne's was back then as well. Yeah, it was, it was, eight, it was eight, on the day. and I was before the fight. I think that's a more fair, fair thing to do, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But I, I, that, that, I, I put that in my notes. I was very shocked to find that they weighed in like at uh, ten hours before they were due to walk in. Yeah. So yeah, you got middleweights fighting middleweights, but in, uh, ha- Le- Leonard never looked smaller, did he? No. You know they looked that's... equally, equally the same size. I mean, he had a full like. Um six years to grow into that weight didn't he oh yeah of course he has yeah <laughs> if they'd have fought when they, they, yeah if they'd have fought when they originally thought they were going to fight he would have looked smaller because he was coming up two weight classes then wasn't he yeah 150 for Kevin Howard in 1984 so three years later he was 1658 so obviously putting on eight pounds mm. it's not a lot of weight really is it <laughs> so obviously we get a decision and it doesn't go in Hagler's it doesn't go Hagler's way. And then we don't see Hagler in the ring again. The rumor is that he never even put on a pair of boxing gloves again because he was so disgusted. My argument is different to that. I think Hagler knew he lost, right? And it started with that little dance he done at the end, you know? He's doing this jive that dance and he's... You know that false smile that people do when they're trying to cover up something? Well, Hagler was doing that to his corner work. He was like high-fiving people. And he was, if you watch him, he's dancing for a solid 90 seconds, right? And he's doing this like weird body mm-hmm. popping sort of thing. Now, that's, that, that was totally out of character, right? He was peacocking. Yeah. And I, I think I, he was done as well. In the, like, Do you know when you think back the the referee? And I think when, when uh, Ray Leonard sort of threw the ball of punch... Could have been argued as a low blow. Steele didn't say keep him up that much. There was no admonishing, and, and and like Leonard did a lot of running in the last couple of rounds, like uh, round twelve. But he knew like, we lost, though. You can say that. Hagler, I think he was trying to play along, wasn't he? Like you said. Yeah, but after the fight is over, um, after the fight was over, he's still doing that peacock game where Leonard is up on the ropes and he's going, yeah, you know, and Hagler's doing all this. It just come across as false, right? And then you get the fact that his excuse was, he said, well, he didn't do enough to beat me. So that there in itself is Hagler saying, I didn't do enough either, but he should have done a little bit more than my not enough. And then yeah. then the fight, the rematch never happened. And you talk to, you see Leonard talking three, four years ago. He said, the fight, the t- he said, the, we offered him a rematch. He said, we offered him a rematch and he, he started saying he disappeared to Italy saying that I was hard to negotiate with he said but it wasn't as hard as it was the first time and he took that fight and I think Hagler was had, had, had enough of boxing you know and if you're going to yeah, go out you can go out with some controversy where you split the marketplace with 50% thinking you won thinking 50% think you lost and I think, he, I think deep down he can live with that because to come back and have that rematch with Leonard and then lose definitively, which he probably would have because Leonard would have shaken off a little bit more ring rest. Hagler's got older, another training camp to mm. go through. He couldn't handle the second. His legacy couldn't handle this, uh, you know, a clear decision loss to him. So I think Hagler, he kept this na- narrative going about I was robbed, he didn't do enough, he didn't but, box me. And I think like that, that... In the press, though, in the press, we didn't see a rematch offered. Like he was like Hagler was in the in Ring magazine saying he wanted a, a rematch, but Leonard didn't seem to offer it publicly. Uh, he's saying he offered it before, but it didn't seem like mm. it was offered. You can't think that there, there was an offer. I I, I believe Leonard. Yeah, the offer was there definitely uh, three years later. But then that was three years later. But whether it was, it was uh, an immediate rematch, who did it? I don't think it was. No, maybe not immediate, but I, I think within a year, Leonard seems to think that, I mean, it didn't take long for Hagler to have sticks and go. Now, Hagler, no. now, you know, and I look think, at the stuff Hagler yeah. agreed to in the first fight, because he underestimated Leonard. 
he would have if he truly thought because Hagler said he's walking away because Leonard was giving him ridiculous offers for a rematch right if you're that confident and you're that hurt by you, you know you're that hurt by the result you take whatever you get because you're convinced you stop him yeah and Hagler didn't chase it he just he left the country and never thought about boxing I think it was his retirement plan he just got out of there he got jaded with boxing he knew he lost couldn't risk the effect of a second loss so it was easier just to but what a perfect way to retire you know he made he, he kept his uh, legacy intact his aura well, remained think, the same I think he gave a like a deadline didn't he for the rematch I think he was like a th- he wanted a three month negotiation thing and I think it didn't come within the three months. And I think it came afterwards. And I think by that time, and he'd lost interest. I think. Yeah, well, I, think I would set that. Get... I, I, I would set if I if I was Hagler, I would have set an unrealistic deadline for negotiations. Yeah, you know, because that's why the Donny Lalonde fight came came later. And... Mm. I think I think Hagler knew he lost, and he just didn't have a good enough reason as an excuse. Yeah. And then everyone started taking his side, so he was like, okay, I'll just further this, and then. I didn't really lose, you know. Only half the population thought I lost. That's all. The other half thought I won. Yeah. I just it reminded me of the Timothy Bradley nonsense with Manny Pacquiao, and I well, scored. He lost that. all three fights to Pacquiao. Didn't he? I I, mean. I actually watched it with my brother-in-law, the first one, and he said, "Oh, Pacquiao hammered him." I said, "Yeah, he hammered him the rounds he won, but he took his foot off the gas in the rounds he didn't, and those add up." So I, I had to score a draw, and I said, and I remember before the decision came out, I said to Andrew, my brother-in-law, I said, Pacquiao's in danger of losing by, and he said, how? He battered the hell out of him. He bambi legged him multiple times. I said, yeah, yeah, but he took rounds off. See, but but that's where the scoring is uh, not good. Like like I said years ago, with the half point system, you would have had more accuracy because you'd have given Pacquiao a full point for battering him, and then Bradley an half a point for, for stealing around, you know. Mm. So Either way, you, you I would try. suggest go go back to any one of these fights and uh, do that sort of scoring see, see what you come up with it could be any fight it could be the Wilder Tyson Fury it could be Hagler Leonard anyone but have a look at that have a look into that see if you can pick a fight at some point and score it that way because you, you were a big Hagler fan were you? was he you? yeah I, yeah. I what, yeah, he was at, like an anorak when he lost I thought I'd watch the fight again and count the money do a punch count and it, yeah. I did have Agla sort of winning because some of the rounds which are close I suppose I scored even <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah it was one of those fights where you, like today though if, if, if you had sort of reversed it round you know made made Hagla the underdog like like a three, three year layoff you would have probably thought he had a good performance as well wouldn't you yeah, exactly. I think you hit the nail on the head there. I think whoever went into that fight, coming from a five-year uh, ring loss, you know, come, come, who hadn't boxed for five years, was going to get the vote because he was heroic. Hagler was just doing what he's supposed to do. And yeah. then this guy, come, you would never know. <laughs> you know, Sugar Land was always going to win the decision if he got there, if he got to yeah. the end. <laughs> you know, it was just... It's a weird one because even in the first four rounds where they say, "Oh, Leonard swept it." Well, I read about it first this week before I thought I'd watch it, right? So I thought I'd read about it. And they said, "Well, Leonard blitzed to a four-round lead." When I watched that, every time I watched it this week, it wasn't a blitz to a four-round. They were four close rounds, and Hagler yeah, yeah. was doing this nonsense, you know, orthodox stance, and he was still maybe just edging the rounds lost. But I could have given one of the. I could have comfortably given one or two of the first I, four rounds to like Hagler. I gave Hagler round four. Yeah, the, you know they, they, would... they, they weren't swept, were they? They weren't. You weren't. Yeah. Mm, yeah, I... it was controversial, to say the least. Yeah, it, it's like while I'm convinced that Leonard did win, I still don't know how much the narrative plays a part, even 32 years later. You know. I think you should change the commentary for someone like Steve Bunce and uh, Barney Jones. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it, you, 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 you're either switching for a Hagler supporter who thinks a boxer should be going forward all the time, or you, you're never... <laughs> and it, watching yeah. it in silence, you need to hear the sound of the punches. There's no way in this day and age to unbiasedly watch this fight. Yeah, because you've got two polar opposite styles as well. 
yeah, it's whatever you wake up. I might wake up today and think I prefer aggression fighting, or I might wake up tomorrow and say no, I think it's ring generalship. I, yeah. Not even I can stay consistent on this on this fight, and I've only got myself to convince. Yeah, what an yeah, amazing it's... fight! You know, this is a weekly scare, you know thing for us to talk about. What what a, what an amazing week to start! What an amazing fight to start on, where even to to this day. You got a gut yeah, feeling that yeah, you think you won, but I know that could change next year. I might think Agla won it. Yeah. Weird. It's but a good. It's a, it's a classic example of a super fight, and although it's been eclipsed since then with big, bigger numbers by other fights, then and probably more global uh, fights like Pacquiao Mayweather, you hmm. still got what you paid for in this fight. Well, I was trying to think of the equivalent. Would it be the equivalent of? Now, what would he be equivalent? So Mayweather's like two to three years removed from his boxing career, so it'd be him moving up to travel. Say Triple G beat Alvarez, it'd be the same sort of same set as no, a setup. Well, Mayweather came from super, from super featherweight, didn't he? So he's already gone up a few divisions. Yeah, there's so no. You're probably looking at I don't know, looking like an Errol. Well, Errol Spence fighting the next dominant middleweight. If Errol Spence retires for four, five years, yeah, and then that's comes the thing back, that normally people can do that. As I mean, it's what an amazing story! It was we're never going to see a build-up, you know, perfect circumstance. You know, it was just crazy. It, it was, you know, how dare Sugar Ray Leonard after being out for five years, you know, having one fight in that meantime, looking like shit, challenging in Hagler, and the fight getting made on his terms. Yeah. <laughs> On top of that, you've got to question the governing bodies allowing it because... Well, it was only WPC sanctioned it. It was only yeah. for the WPC title, but we, we know Solomon's not going to turn that down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so he'll, he'll, he'll put anybody in with anybody, wouldn't he, for the money? Yeah, even his son would let Sugar Ray Leonard fight for a WPC I reckon if, belt now. If some, someone like, um, I don't know, Leon Spinks came back now and wanted a title fight, he'd probably say, yeah, go on. Yeah, <laughs> you look at it from the WPC. That's is how corrupt the WPC were, right? They got a long-standing champion, and he says, "I want to fight a guy who's never fought in my weight before." And hand, not only that, hasn't fought in five years. And we're like, "We'll sanction it." What's our cut? Yeah. 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 Because the other contenders, title. yeah, the other contenders would have been a bit miffed as well when they uh, not having a chance. Like Harold Graham was was one. Um, obviously, Sam Bukalambe fought for the title. Mike McCallum would have. Come up with weight, yeah. Uh, Michael and then Michael Elijah Day and Frank Tate, because so I, I one of those guys. Well, my memory was that fight was for the undisputed title. So in my research this week, I was surprised it, it to see was that, in a way. Yeah, it, it definitely was, was, but it, it what was it was. Always... Only the WBA and IBF existed as well, but they were vacant at the time because I think that the title was was vacated in order to fight Leonard. Yeah, that's that's my understanding that's, of it. Yeah. Yeah. So he was undisputed because nobody else was champion. Hmm. But it, it was. I just imagine. I just remember seeing three belts, but I've obviously had that in hindsight, you know. Yeah. So is it? Have you got anything else to say? I think I proved to you that Hagler lost. Uh, you were wrong, and I'm right. So. That <laughs> and I say I'm right if I, if I use the old British scoring and have a close round scored as a close round half point, but they were. It's horses <laughs> for courses. And that concludes uh, our, our first there, what, ever fight from the past, isn't it? Uh, one of the quote from uh, Leonard used to try and wind Hagler up after he retired. As Hagler, when he got into his Italian filmmaking, he said. I can't see Hagler playing a love scene. <laughs> just to wind the guy up a bit more. Like. He's a dick. Like, just leave a goal, and you ruined this guy's <laughs> life. You, you ruined him. And, and you're still having digs all these years later. And this guy thought you were his friend. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the sad part, I think. When Hagler takes you as a friend, I think that you're a friend or a foe. Either, he's black and white, and he. You, you, you get that impression with Hagler. He's a friend for life, where you get the impression with Leonard that He's no one's friend. <laughs> he's all, he's just Leonard's yeah. friend. He's just he's he's just after number one. So he just looks in the mirror and he says, "I'm my own friend." Yeah. He's a crazy man. I honestly think he's a crazy man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, brilliant. I really enjoyed this episode. So I must go about these two now. They they both sort of fit and healthy and still, uh, well, being good ambassadors for boxing. So good for them. 
Yeah, and it, and and Leonard still got. I seen him interview two or three years ago. He still got a wink, a cheesy grin when the Agler's name comes up, and he digs it in a little bit. He's still trolling him after all these years. He's a yeah. awesome guy. I, I just, you know, I love Leonard. Uh, let's I love give a, Agler. a recommendation for a Leonard interview, and it's go on YouTube and have a look at Hugh McIlvanny interviewing Sugar Ray Leonard. So oh, the late Hugh much. McIlvanny. Died a couple of months ago. The late Hugh McIlvanny. Yeah. That's a good writer he was. Right, so that wraps us up for this week's episode. Uh, We'll see you all again next week with another blast from the past and another prospect of the week. And obviously, we're going to wrap up the news and the reviews and the fights ahead.